Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for our science conversation about pharmaceuticals in our rivers and streams. Uh, it's really wonderful uh, for those of you who are new to us. I'll say a few words about Carrie. It looks like we have quite a few people uh, who have just discovered us. It's been one of the great things about our virtual lectures is that people from all over the country and all over the world uh, have been coming to them. So thank you for joining us. Uh, the Cary Institute is based in Millbrook, New York, about 100 miles uh, up the Hudson from New York City. We've been around for over 35 years, almost 40. And we are an independent research institute specializing in ecosystem level studies uh, of ecology. We have many different threads of research but our main areas of, of endeavor are freshwater ecology, which we'll be talking about tonight, forest ecology, disease ecology, and particularly pandemic spillover, which turns out to be a rather important subject these days, uh, and, most, uh, and, and also urban ecology, which despite uh, being uh, based in the very rural uh, Dutchess County, uh, we've been urban ecologists for almost 30 years. So, uh, almost half of you, this is the first time attending a carry event, and uh, we have a nice group uh, spread over lots of different categories. So uh, thank you for, for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce one of our senior scientists, Emma Rosie. Emma Rosie joined Carry Institute about 12 years ago when she left a tenured position at uh, professorship at Loyola University in Chicago. Um, before that, she'd been a undergraduate at the University of Michigan and did her master's and her PhD at the University of Georgia in Athens. Emma, I like to say there are several Emmas because I am still six years into my tenure as president, not quite sure how Emma gets as much done as she does. Uh, she has a very diverse research portfolio, which broadly addresses issues of land use, urbanization, and how climate change affect and shape uh, freshwater ecosystems. But her projects range from a collaborative long-term project on, hip, on how wildebeest and hippos uh, affect the food webs and the ecology of the Mara River in Kenya. Uh, she is shepherding a almost 60-year uh, data set that was started by founder, uh, Carrie founder Gene Likens at the Hubbard Brook Research Forest in New Hampshire. This data set looks at stream ecology and stream biogeochemistry, so the nutrients in the stream uh, and it is through that study that acid rain was discovered. Uh, Emma and uh, Emily Bernhardt at Duke, who's a CARI trustee, uh, have taken over that project and we hope to keep it going at least for another 50 years. Uh, these long-term data sets are critically important to understanding how changes in ecosystems manifest themselves through time. Uh, Emma also has a very diverse portfolio looking at environmental contaminants, particularly uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products and how they intersect with aging water infrastructure, which is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Emma was recently appointed to the Science Advisory Board of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. She joined in January 21, um, and that is a critically important position because she is one of a handful of advisors uh, to the Biden administration on how EPA uh, can better regulate um, um, things like pollutants in our environment. She also serves on an ad hoc committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, which is looking at the environmental impact of currently marketed sunscreens uh, and the potential human impacts of changes in sunscreen usage. Uh, who, would, who would think, but sunscreens are a potential uh, pollutant um, in, uh, in the environment. Um, those are really important policy uh, positions that Emma has. Uh, because of those positions, we're going to focus on the science tonight, and I will not be answering policy questions too directly. Uh, Emma may talk a bit about policy in, in answering some of my questions, but mostly uh, we're going to focus on the science. So, Emma, uh, it would be great if you could uh, join us. Great. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and thank you. Um, and uh, Emma, like many of our scientists, has been somewhat peripatetic, but she is back in Millbrook. So we are almost together uh, tonight. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm really in, always interested in is the sort of, you know, why question, right? Why is it or how is it uh, that you came to even think to study some of the impacts of, of, of pharmaceuticals, personal care products, uh, sunscreen? Um, in the environment, because it's not an area that is 
you know, overloaded with researchers. So what was it that brought you here and, and what's your sort of history? Yeah, that's a really great question. I um, was doing my doctoral work, dissertation research in the Chattahoochee River in Atlanta, um, a large number of years ago. And I was um, studying the effects of more traditional contaminants like trace metals and how they affect uh, the quality of food resources for aquatic insects. And, and in my research, I found that although there was a link to sewage, sewage uh, contributed to declines in the quality of this food resource, there was no link uh, to trace metals, these traditional contaminants. Mm -hmm. And right at the same time that I was doing this research was some really groundbreaking research that was done by folks in Europe, scientists that were detecting for the very first time, very low concentrations of pharmaceuticals in the environment. And that really struck my curiosity because it's like, well, maybe these things that are these biologically active compounds might be affecting the rivers that I study. And so I sort of filed that away, um, in, it, thought about it. And then when I became a professor, I um, started writing grant proposals to do this kind of work. Right. And, and um, we could talk for probably the whole hour about the frustration of uh, doing bleeding edge research uh, for those of you who are not scientists, it's really actually rather challenging when you come up with a whole new idea and getting funding for it has been a real challenge. Emma worked very hard for that. Um, and so tell us, what have you discovered? Are there indeed uh, drugs in our rivers and streams? Yeah, so um, research that's been done by scientists all over the world um, have detected pharmaceuticals and personal care products in rivers and streams and lakes and water bodies. Um, they're found in the environment and the way that they get there um, is basically a few different um, pathways um, from our wastewater. So when we uh, ingest pharmaceuticals, um, we take them into our bodies and then they go down the drain to wastewater treatment plants. Um, we have to manufacture these pharmaceuticals. And so um, work that's been done by uh, colleagues at the US Geological Survey have demonstrated that downstream of pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities, you can find high concentrations of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> we also use pharmaceuticals in our agriculture. So in order to have a uh, large combined uh, confined animal feeding operations, um, we use things like antibiotics uh, for uh, in, in this uh, animal husbandry, and so those can end up in the environment. So there's a number of pathways that, that drugs that we use in our everyday lives end up in surface waters. And, and those, when they end up there, um, you know, they, we use them because they're valuable and useful. Um, do, uh, do we dispose of them well? Do we metabolize them? When they end up in the wastewater, can they be removed by sewage treatment? What's the sort of life cycle of a drug from the time I buy it at the pharmacy till the time uh, it gets into the waterway and then goes through the water system? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let's remember that it also starts from the time it's manufactured. So, right. the, and and I should, I should step back and say, you know, pharmaceuticals are, a boon to human health. They're amazing. Um, and they have made so many people's lives better. Um, think about the antibiotics that we take that keep us alive when we're facing um, bacterial infections or antidepressants that can really be life-changing and transformative for people. So pharmaceuticals can be a real wonderful part of, um, of life today. Um, but the problem is that, or a problem is that we, um, we develop them, we use them. When we take them, ingest them into our bodies, our bodies don't fully metabolize them. Some they do, but others they don't. And so they end up in our waste streams and our wastewater treatment plants, which also do amazing things for us. Um, wastewater treatment plants are a really great um, part of keeping fresh water is clean. Um, they're not designed to remove pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And so even if they're at the, the best technology for today, they're not designed to remove them. And so um, we, we need to, to think about the fact that, you know, this, this positive for humans is then, you know, if, if it's getting through our wastewater treatment plants, it's then ending up in the environment. Right. And it also can leak out. And, yes. You know, yes. You know, I mean, it's, we, they, they, it's also problematic. I mean, we're maybe build back better. We'll put some money into building back waste treatment better because God knows it's in many of our cities, it's what, 100, 110 years old. 
Yeah, that's a great point. The, in, in many places around this country, the wastewater treatment infrastructure is failing. So the American uh, Society for Civil Engineers gives our infrastructure a grade for sewage infrastructure, a D plus. So right. that's a failing grade where, when I, <laughs> where I come from. So, you know, it's, it, it really needs, we need a lot of more um, spending on maintaining our infrastructure so that yeah. it doesn't leak. Yeah, and and you know, there's been a lot in the in the news recently about infrastructure and how we are less good than other places. Is this wastewater infrastructure problem common to the entire world, or are some places doing it better, or are some places doing it worse? Yeah, so um, actually, the UN estimates that only. 10% of the wastewater in the world is properly treated. So wow. most of the wastewater um, that's generated by humans around the world is being discharged, um, many to coastal zones, much of it is to coastal zones. Um, and so although we have exported pharmaceutical technology around the world, which is wonderful um, for human health, um, we have not done such a good job exporting wastewater treatment technology and, uh, and the funds that are required to build that technology out in, in, in countries around the world. Well, being the eternal optimist, at least then if we do, we can build better waste treatment that actually filters out these things, right? right. Since, since we, we, we built ours 100 years ago before this was even an issue. So speaking of which, what kind of things are you finding? I mean, what gets into the wastewater? And are, I mean, if, if I take three different uh, drugs and over-the-counter prescription uh, and a hair care product, are they all the same in terms of how they move through the system? No, they move through differently, but the one thing is in common, and the reason we categorize these pharmaceuticals and personal care products, we, we put them together as a category of pollutants because of the fact that they tend to follow the same pathway to the environment. And so, you know, they, and, and the, the thing about these compounds is where we're finding them, we find a, a large diversity of compounds. So we're talking about complex mixtures of bioactive um, <laughs> uh, chemicals in the environment. So, you know, where you find one, you may find dozens. And so that's also a real challenge from a scientific perspective to try and understand how these things might interact with each other. Right, because you, you, yeah, you have a soup. Yeah, you have a soup of various different things. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, if you go to the doctor, they are, they're going to ask you when you're taking one medicine, why are you taking this other one? Because we know that they interact in our bodies, but it's less well understood how these compounds interact in, in um, animals' bodies or out in the environment. Right. And, and, you know, some things speed you up, some things slow you down. And does, does the same thing happen to other organisms? Yeah. Yeah. We right? don't know that. No. Well, we can talk a little more about that. But, you know, I, I, I think uh, many people who know Cary Institute know that uh, our earliest uh, uh, considered work on urban ecology was and has been in Baltimore. And so for a couple decades, we've been measuring water quality in Baltimore and looking at the streams. And, and have you been finding drugs in the streams in Baltimore? And if so, which ones? And what, what have we discovered over that long-term study? Yeah, so we on, on a couple of times during the course of that study, we've sampled for pharmaceuticals. But most recently, this is a um, what's on the screen now is some um, a very recent study uh, that we've been working on where we took samples every week of and screened for pharmaceuticals. So we screened for 97 different pharmaceuticals. And then at the same time that we took the, measured the concentration, we measured the size of the river. So a river sometimes is large, sometimes it's small. That's called the discharge. So we measured um, the dynamics of the river in addition to the concentration. And when we do those two things together, we can then estimate what we call load the amount of drugs that that river is then entering um, or discharging into, for example, the, the Baltimore okay. Harbor here. Right. And what you can see from that is um, what we estimate is um, just putting it in the perspective of human doses, about 35,000 doses of antidepressants are coming. And that's only from um, leaks in the infrastructure. There's no wastewater treatment plant in that basin. It's just leaking infrastructure. Um, and then 30,000 doses of painkillers and about 1,000 doses of antibiotics. And that's every year? Every year. 
every year from the leaks in the infrastructure. The city of Baltimore, the Department of Public Works is working really hard to fix those leaks. Um, but you know, these, the, this, the infrastructure in Baltimore is over a hundred years old. And so trying you know, you, to fix those leaks and shore up the problem is gonna take um, investment. Uh, and, 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 but it does add up to um, significant amounts of these uh, residues ending up in the environment. And you were able to look at that in relationship to the number of sales, weren't yes. you? That was, yes. so that was we, a really interesting part of that paper. Yeah, so the other thing that we did is we, we did what we call a mass balance, where we basically said, well, in that watershed, how many people live there? On average, how much, for example, Tylenol do they take, acetaminophen? And then we figured out the pathways, the routes that it takes. And what's really interesting is depending on which different which drug it is. So uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen, I should say, is very uh, readily um, taken up in our tissue. We metabolize it very, very, very well. And um, wastewater treatment plants remove it very effectively. So the main pathway that um, acetaminophen enters the harbor is through leaks in the infrastructure. That's in contrast to another antibiotic that we investigated that actually we don't metabolize well. Um, wastewater treatment plants don't remove it very effectively. So the main source or pathway that this um, drug takes to the environment is through the wastewater treatment plants. That kind of information is really valuable in trying to understand how to um, mitigate some of these problems. You know, some drugs, it's going to be really helpful to fix the leaks in the infrastructure. Right. Others, it would be good to upgrade the facilities to then remove them. Um, well, and so it's really important to think about these. It's, they're very different structures depending right. on um, the chemical compound. And, and you end up with these sort of perverse, you know, acetaminophen where there's much more of it in, the, in, our, in our systems because we take a lot more of it than we do of, of yes. antibiotics. Yes. So you end up with about the same concentration, but yes. wildly different pathways. Yes, exactly. So those two drugs, the trimethoprim and the acetaminophen, the same amount is actually entering the harbor about the same yeah. amount per year, yeah. but and, the pathways that they get there is very different. And I'm going to just give a little sneak preview that you're going to sort of take this Baltimore work and try and take it national and use the same approach uh, to figure out what our national load is because no one's ever done that. Yeah, we'd like to be able to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, no one's ever done it. And I'm just trying to let you all know that this is really um, a, a field in which uh, a lot of, of science has not been pursued yet. Um, so there's a lot to learn. Is this, you know, just an urban stream problem or does it occur in rural areas, in remote areas? What, what's the scale of the problem at either a national or a global level, whichever you'd like to jump in on? Yeah, so that's a great question, Josh. Basically, because people use these compounds in our everyday lives, where people go, we bring these residues with us. And so the image on the screen, I think is um, the uh, case of Antarctic, the Antarctic Peninsula. There was a study that was done a number of years ago where they detected pharmaceuticals in Antarctica. There was another study where pharmaceuticals are detected in um, US national parks because there are tourists there and the tourists go to Antarctica and, and with us, we take um, the drugs that we need on, in, our, in our lives, um, but then they end up um, in the environment. So it's really um, a, a ubiquitous issue in surface waters. It's not just below a wastewater treatment plant or an urban stream. They're found, these residues are found um, in systems all over. Right, and it reminds me of when we thought PCBs were a local problem, then a national problem, and then all of a sudden they were being found in the blubber of, whale, of whales and seals and, yeah. and polar bears up in the Arctic. And it was, you know, it's clear that that our impact is global, even if its release is more local. Right, right. And it just depends on how we treat our waste. So yeah. if, if your waste is ending up going into the environment, then whatever is with that waste will end up in the environment. Right, right. Um, and, and so, you know, it's sort of, I, I think the first reaction a lot of people have is, okay, so you take some, some Tylenol or you, you take an antidepressant, it goes through your system, it goes in the stream, it's really diluted, right? And, you know, people, you know, those people who have, you know, learned about engineering know that so the solution to pollution is dilution. So why do we care about it? How does it affect other organisms when they're at such, I mean, it's not regulated because it's at such a low level. What's the impact on bacteria or algae or the, uh, the other things that are critical parts of these aquatic systems? Yeah, 
So even though the concentrations are low, um, sometimes in the nanogram per liter concentration, uh, in, in the work that I've done with my collaborators um, here at the Cary Institute and elsewhere, uh, we've focused on these, what we call environmentally relevant concentrations. So most of the work that I've done really looks at the nanogram per liter concentration. And what we found is at the concentrations that we find in the environment, we have found that they can, a number of different drugs, and in fact, others have done this work as well now, um, affect, for example, algae the photosynthesis of algae, the photosynthetic rates of algae can be disrupted by very low concentrations of these drugs. Um, it can also change the composition. So, you know, the algae that live in streams are a diverse assemblage of many different species. And so it can actually change. We found that um, drugs like amphetamines will change which species are there. Um, same thing with bacterial communities, even at the low concentrations or concentrations that are found in the environment, things such as triclosan, um, ciprofloxacin, which is an antibiotic, we've shown that it can change the structure of the bacterial communities. So it, even though the concentrations are low, these are potent biological compounds. The reason that we use them and why they're so effective at treating our human health issues is that they do something to a biological process and we right. share so much of these biological processes with other things in nature. And so the same biochemical processes that, that might be happening in us, um, even though algae are so distantly related, there are some processes that are, are in, we have in common. Well, and antibiotics are out there to kill bacteria, right? right. So it's not yeah. hugely surprising. And that, of course, I mean, those are the things that are at the base of the food chain in a freshwater system. And so when you start messing around, not just with density, but with diversity, you're then potentially changing, uh, sorry, the dogs, um, potentially changing uh, the, the higher level uh, food web uh, interactions. Yeah, exactly. And we, we have a lot of the work in my lab focuses on what we call ecosystem function. So we want to understand, does the function, how the, nit the, the nitrogen is being cycled in a system or how right. much um, energy is being captured from the sun. How is that being disrupted by these compounds? And we have documented myself, my team, and then others um, have been documenting that even at low concentrations, you can have this ecological disruption. Well, and, and you do that both in situ, right, out in the wild, but also you have a wonderful experimental system. And can you talk a little bit about in the experimental system, the kinds of things you do and, and exposing things like insects and algae and you know, to, yeah. to particular doses and, and timing of doses? Yeah, so we have this wonderful facility at the Cary Institute um, that I built when I came here. Um, it's an artificial stream facility. We have 20 artificial streams. Um, they're in a greenhouse. Um, basically, it's like a bathtub with an island. You can see a picture there. There's a paddle wheel that pushes the water around. So it's kind of a blank slate. And what we do is we add things like algae and bacteria, diverse assemblages. We add aquatic insects. Um, we add crayfish. We add a bunch of different organisms to these artificial streams. And then we can add controlled low doses of these compounds and then we can measure well what is the effect on aquatic insects so one right. of the things for example we do is we put nets over the tops of the streams and aquatic insects have this really important um, life history characteristic that they're they're aquatic when they're larvae and then when they uh, are become adults they fly around and so they they become aerial adults and so we put the nets over we have this really cool modified vacuum cleaner and we count how many emerge um, and what we have found is that um, compounds like amphetamine um, and uh, antidepressants can actually change the life history. So more of them emerge when they're exposed to these low concentrations of drugs. We don't really understand why this is happening, um, but, but we know that aquatic insects have the serotonin system in there. It's, it might be a cue to emerge of when to emerge. And so really interesting findings of, um, you know, disruption, again, of these, these, the life history of these animals when exposed to drugs. And it gave us the great, you know, uh, newspaper headline, Bugs on Drugs. Yes. Um, but, but also, I think what's important for, for people to really know is, I mean, you've been doing this across a wide variety of, of compounds, 
right? And and Emma is, I think, the only scientist at Cary who has a, a DEA license, right? And has to very carefully manage uh, the, the drugs we bring in to do this. But those things occur in, in, in the wild now, in nature. We, we put them into systems, so it's really important. Um, so given that, you know, you put them in there, the bugs get frisky, they come out faster, they come out higher densities. Uh, what happens to things that eat those bugs? Yeah, so that's a really great question, Josh. And um, a lot of work has been done in the past on other contaminants and how they move through food webs. And this is something that, you know, from the very beginning of my research, I wanted to pursue this, but I had to wait for the environmental chemists to, to have the techniques, the analytical chemistry techniques to be able to measure this. Um, and this is work that I did in uh, collaboration with some colleagues in Australia. So we did this work in um, streams in Melbourne, Australia. This work was led by Aaron Richmond. Um, and basically what we did was we collected aquatic insects downstream of wastewater treatment plants along an urban rural gradient in streams around Melbourne. And we looked to see whether or not the aquatic insects had drugs in their tissues, and they do. Up to 69 different pharmaceuticals are found in aquatic insects that live in these streams. We also went and we collected spiders. Spiders, um, there are some spiders, tetragnathid spiders that showed in the in this image. Um, they build a net over the stream and they collect emerged aquatic insects. Remember I told you aquatic insects emerge and these spiders, that's what they eat. And so we collected them and they also had residues of many pharmaceuticals in their tissues. That suggests that not only are the drugs in the water causing ecological disruption, the drugs are getting into the food web, the bugs are then carrying them and the spiders are getting them, birds, bats, other things that a lot of animals rely on emerged aquatic insects as a food resource. And so we found that they um, had them, uh, that they may be exposed as well. The other thing that we did is in, in this picture, there's a, a picture of a, a really cool animal that you probably haven't thought about maybe since you were in the elementary school, which is the duck-billed platypus. It's an egg-laying mammal, if you remember. Um, that duck bill, so these are fully aquatic animals. Um, they use that duck bill to scrape aquatic insects off of rocks. They have this like really cool cheek pouch that they put the uh, aquatic insects in. That's all they eat is aquatic insects. And so what we did was then we developed this model to see, well, we know what the concentrations are in the bugs. We know how much a platypus has to eat every day. How much drugs might they be getting from eating their normal diet of aquatic insects? And it turns out, uh, we also did the same model for brown trout. It turns out that, um, for example, for antidepressants, that's up to 60% of a human daily dose um, the platypus is getting from eating aquatic insects. Now we don't know, I really wanna make sure that you understand this. We don't know whether or not those are all bioavailable. We don't know whether or not all the drugs that are found in the aquatic insect tissues could get into a platypus or into a trout. We know that they might, some might because the spiders certainly had them, um, but this is a really important area of research. We need much more research to understand how these drugs might be moving through food webs and what the consequences might be for organisms like the platypus or trout or birds and bats. Right, and we can't assume that they're just very happy platypuses. No, I wouldn't assume Not a that. reasonable assumption. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, um, this is, we, I think we've covered like nine years of your life in, in uh, 32 minutes, which is pretty amazing. Um, let's make sure we have some time for questions, but also what are your, I mean, you, as I said at the beginning, you always have something else brewing, right? Um, never sitting on your laurels and just saying, ooh, this was fun, let's do it again the same way. So what's, what's coming up next? Yeah, um, it's great that you asked me that. So we, we just set up an experiment today in our artificial stream facility. So, so we're doing experiments um, right now, investigating another um, pollutant that is, uh, gets a lot of attention, um, the microplastics. So microplastics are you know, uh, either particles that were designed to be small to begin with, or they're, you know, when we wash our synthetic clothes, they go down the drain. They're often found in wastewater treatment plants the same place that the drugs are found. And so we wanted to know, um, myself and a number of colleagues wanted to know, well, is there an interaction between drugs and microplastics? And so we're currently investigating that in uh, using a series of experiments in our artificial streams. In particular, we're trying to see whether or not 
the residues in animals is different if they're exposed to drugs and microplastics. So stay tuned for more. We will let you know when we find out. Muted. Um, great. And you know, that, that research is the kind of research that's really hard to get funded because it's so speculative. And we're really fortunate to have the Langesail Family Science Innovation Fund, which puts little bits of money, $60,000, $70,000, 80000 into these projects because there's that first tier of research, which is, you know, are, is our hypothesis even possibly correct? But then once you get more data, then we can go out and, and get external funding for it. But I'm really pleased it's been one of the, we've had a bunch of projects that allow us to ask really edgy questions and do work that, you know, many people would say, well, you have no evidence, you have no uh, indication that this is a real problem. So why do you want to study it? So, you know, bravo to you and to Steve Hamilton, who's working with you on this. It's, it's really a great project. Um, I'll also just note, because you, you, you didn't say it, that project in Australia and some of your other projects, when you screen for this, is that what you're doing in collaboration with people in Sweden, where you do that broad screen? And your comment about the research techniques, I think, really needs to be highlighted. Part of the challenge is, trying to figure out how to even measure some of this stuff at such low concentrations. And so you've been stymied early on and then technology leapfrogs and you catch up. Um, any other technologies that you wish existed? This is a well, question that we haven't discussed, so the answer could be no. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the, the, when we're talking about these, um, range of chemicals, you know, we are screening right now um, with my colleague in Sweden, Sweden Dr. Jörker Fick, he works um, with, we work together on this. Um, I think we're screening for 97 different pharmaceuticals, but wow. on the market in the US is there's 1400 pharmaceuticals on the market. So, you know, our, what we can screen for and what we can look for and, and much of the research that I've talked about, I, I talk about this compound or that compound, I feel that we are scratching the surface. We don't, there's so much more that we need to understand about how these things move and change and break down in the environment, um, how they move through food webs, what the ecological effects might be, what the combinations might do. There's a lot of really exciting research and I, I, there's a lot of people now working on this. Um, a great generation of um, scientists are tackling this issue and it's really exciting to see. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, I'm trying to remember, you had a slide early in when I arrived at Carrie, you had this great slide. It was like, what, a thousand compounds? And now yeah. there are tens of thousands of compounds, many of which have never been tested. Yes, that's correct. I, the, um, yeah, I, 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 sh I show a slide that is from a paper that I published with Emily Bernhardt and Mark Gessner a number of years ago, where we, we argued that synthetic chemicals um, are agents of global change. They're globally distributed and their um, diversity and amounts that we use are, have been on the rise. Um, and, we, and we know that they're distributed around the world and, and yet there's less research uh, focused on this um, than I think maybe is warranted. We, we really, if we're gonna understand the world um, in the Anthropocene, the era in which we are fundamentally um, humans altering the chemistry of the planet, we need to have this kind of research to understand what, especially these um, potent biologically active compounds do. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, I, and, and people should know that, that you've been doing this long enough. So that next generation, a good chunk of them are your former students and postdocs. And now they're getting positions where they can do research. And it's really exciting. I think you're right that to see that that uh, intergenerational, uh, not just transfer, but, uh, you know, sort of enthusiasm um, as, as we move on. So we've talked a lot about this. There are a lot of questions, so we'll not have any problem filling the time. But I just want to ask, you know, people always want to know, what can you do? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, what can we do that will help, if not solve this problem, uh, remediate it, address it, uh, and, and get us moving forward in a better way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that you can do is dispose of your unwanted medications for yourself and for your pets and for other family members, dispose of them properly. There are 
Um, in New York State, I know that there are take back programs. Um, other states, I know that there is in Connecticut because that's nearby me. Um, and if there aren't take back programs, speak to your pharmacist and find out if they can take them. Because then when, they, when you take them to a pharmacist or um, the state troopers, they will then dispose of them properly instead of flushing them down the toilet. So please um, dispose of unwanted medications, expired medications properly. Um, if you put them down the drain, they're going to end up in wastewater treatment plants and cause problems. The other thing that you can do is um, use your voice. Uh, we talked about infrastructure and how infrastructure in this in this country really needs to be um, fixed. Uh, and and the wastewater treatment plants would be it would be great to upgrade them. Um, but that is it's controlled by the way that we you know spend federal, local, state dollars. And so you know advocating for um, uh, you know, improving our wastewater infrastructure is has so many um, positives. And then, of course, supporting science. This kind of research uh, that we talked about today is is not possible without support. So this kind of research um, really helps to understand these these scientific mysteries, problems that that exist. And so, supporting science is um, uh, another thing that folks can do. Yeah, and and the EPA really can't regulate these until they're told to regulate them. So it's. You know, your, your voice out there is really important and, and letting your congressional delegations know that you think this is an important issue. Uh, you know, writing, writing your congressman and your senators is, is a valuable thing to do. Um, okay, let's, let's um, I'm just making sure I don't have any other questions. No, I think, I think we got to the end of mine. Um, so I'm gonna give you what I will call a Kathy Weathers question, even though it was not asked by Kathy Weathers. Mike Grayson, an anonymous uh, attendee, asked a question about aerial transfer, All right? Kathy, who's a staff member at Cary, has studied the way fog moves compounds around. And so the question was, you know, could some of these pharmaceuticals evaporate and attach to water molecules raining down in other areas? Yeah, I don't really know. That's a really great question. And like so much of this research, I don't have the answer to it. So it would be excellent if someone could do it. Now, one thing I do know is that sometimes um, uh, there, there's been some research where people have looked at um, other things associated with sewage or rivers because, you know, you can, the water can then, little bits and particles can go up into the air and then and spread around that way. But I just don't know about pharmaceuticals. I think it would be a great research. Maybe someone is doing research on it and I haven't kept up on it because there's a right. lot of really great research out there. Well, that's good, right? Yeah. There, it's good that it's expanding so quickly that you can't keep track of it. Um, you know, uh, one of the other questions, a, a bunch of people, you know, some of the earliest work on endocrine disruptors, right, came in and has there been work on birth control? And that was some, I, I believe that was some of the earlier work done on this issue. Yeah. Yeah, so um, a number of folks have studied the influence of pharmaceuticals on endocrine disruption um, and, and looked and people may have heard about the fact that we have found, um, you know, fish that have that are called intersex fish. Um, there was a really great study done by Karen Kidd in, in Canada where they added a very environmentally relevant concentration of, of uh, birth control, the EE2 ethanyl estradiol into a lake and saw the effects on, on the fish populations okay. and yeah. saw that there was a crash in, a, in fathead minnows. So there's been some, there's, a, there's quite a bit of work on endocrine disruption. And it's been shown that a number of these compounds will um, disrupt the endocrine system. Um, myself as an ecologist, I'm not an endocrinologist, so I don't investigate that. I have been investigating, well, are there ecological consequences, which is why, and as an ecosystem scientist, that's why I focus on ecosystem function or the structure of communities, interactions between animals. And so um, we wrote a paper a number of years ago, Aaron Richman led this paper on the role of these as ecological disruptors. So there's endocrine disruption. And then we said, well, we also should consider the ecological disruption, um, which is something different than toxicity. Toxicity is when you know something dies at you know a high concentration will lead to um, you know, an organism facing mortality. But you know if something doesn't die but it changes its behavior or if it um, you know it it changes its life history, that's what we call ecological disruption. And I think we need to be concerned with um, the multiple dimensions that might occur from endocrine and, disruption all the way to mortality. Right. And and seeing you know. Uh, uh fish that have, have changed sex or, or multiple sex is very visible, but that kind of very subtle ecological disruption is much harder to study. Yes, correct. So, 
So that's that's important. There are a couple of questions I'm going to try and put them together and see if I'm successful, but they sort of center around monitoring and or effectiveness of sewage treatment. So uh, one question was, you know, is anybody doing sort of systematic monitoring now that we know that these things are leaking out? Do people collect water downstream from plants and is uh, sewage treatment plants? And is this a, uh, a, a structured study now or are we still sort of catch as catch can? Yeah, so the US Geological Survey um has done excellent work on this. The, uh, Paul Bradley is the person who's leading the, the publications recently where they've been sampling all around the US and looking for pharmaceuticals in the environment. So, and it's a very systematic, they go and revisit places. Um, Europeans, I know that there's a number of studies on the Danube, on the, on the Seine where they take samples on a very regular basis to, to measure these. Um, I do wanna point out though, uh, so we measure water chemistry at Haverbrook and at Baltimore, these places where we've been studying for 60 years or 20 years, respectively. Um, the, those are inexpensive things to measure. Water chemistry, the, uh, the things that, that we measure, at, for example, at Haverbrook, it's still expensive, but pharmaceuticals, being able to measure pharmaceuticals is very expensive technology. The prices are coming down, but as a monitoring tool, it can be very, um, it, at this point, it can be still cost prohibitive. If, uh, you know, if a watershed group wants to go out and monitor every week, it would be very expensive to take those samples. And so I'm really hoping that as time goes on, the price of um, doing the analytical chemistry will come down because that kind of monitoring is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then I guess you asked the question about wastewater treatment plants as well. Yeah, so and, wastewater, and, yeah and also I'm going to add in another question. They're not doing a great job now, but is there technology already available that could, yeah. could if we, we could re, refit or retrofit? Yeah, so I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Wastewater treatment plants are not designed to remove pharmaceuticals. So wastewater treatment plants are doing a fine job for how they're designed. They're just right. not designed to remove these. And wastewater treatment plants are such a boon for freshwater systems. It's a wonderful thing that we treat our waste. Um, but these are, we call them contaminants of emerging concern. It's just, we didn't realize that they were a problem. And so um, now, or that they may be a problem, I should say. Um, there are wastewater treatment plant engineers. That's not what I do. There are professors of engineering that are working on developing new techniques, new technologies to remove these different types of residues with various different processes. So I know that there are, there's technologies coming online, but like anything, a brand new technology is going to be expensive. And so it's got to be something that, you know, if a municipality um, has the resources and has the um, you know, the wherewithal to upgrade the facility, then, then the potential of that technology is potentially there, but it's going to come at a cost. Right. And, and as the uh, measurement downstream will get cheaper as technology improves, one assumes that as we build new technologies and they become widely diffused and, and deployed, that the cost per unit will go down as well. And so that there is a virtuous cycle on both these sides. You know, I mean, if you think about molecular biology, uh, number one, we didn't have eDNA, environmental DNA, 10, 20 years ago, but the, the ability to sequence genes has gone from impossible to expensive and difficult to pretty much routine. Right. And, the, and so the technology really is uh, moving really quickly. Um, there's another interesting question about uh, that, that uh, combines two areas of, of endeavor for carry scientists this issue of the impacts of pharmaceuticals on algal growth, but also whether they could do things like promote cyanobacteria and be uh, involved with harmful algal blooms. And I was just wondering, has anybody sort of investigated whether some of these uh, novel pollutants um, are potentially uh, moving uh, uh, cyanobacteria and other uh, harmful algal blooms? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, that I, I suspect that there are people focusing on that. I don't really know, but there, I'm sure there are. There, the, one comp, the one compound that we studied that showed some indication that it might lead to this, um, but I, I don't know, this was a number of years ago, and I think other people have done research on it, but we, when we added triclosan for, to an artificial stream, we actually saw an increase in cyanobacteria. We don't know why. Other people have done research on this. So there's, I think that, um, again, um, Thinking about these 
biologically active compounds and the potential that they have to change and disrupt the ecological communities, there may be consequences to changing and disrupting ecological communities. You may get organisms that you don't want, um, or you know, some that might do things that you know potentially a harmful algal bloom, you know, or other other unwanted um, ecological consequences. I, again, I think. I don't know if someone's working on that. I suspect someone is because it's a right. really great question. Well, um, and, and yeah. even, you know, even the more rapid emergence of insects could lead to more pred pred predators and then depress prey populations of uh, within a fish community. I mean, one could sort of spin a lot of interesting ideas yeah. out of this. So, yeah, yeah. The I mean, the thing about the life history of aquatic insects, you know, there are some um, birds that time their migration to arrive at a place when, for example, stoneflies are emerging from a river. So, right. you know, disrupting these ecological processes could have consequences beyond just the animal you're looking at. And that's one of the things that's so fascinating about ecology in general, is that there's all these connections and links. And so you have to start thinking about um, how things might affect multiple um, organisms. Yeah, and it's a field where we can always absorb more people because there are more questions than we can answer. Yes, absolutely. You know, so somebody, a couple people asked about whether there's a similar pattern of leakiness in septic systems, uh, because, you know, around where we live, at least so many people are on septic rather than on, on a sewage uh, system. And has anybody looked at that or is it yeah. filtered differently? Yeah, so septic systems, um, there has been some research on septic systems. They are certainly um, some drugs will get broken down in a functioning septic system. Some will come out similar to a wastewater treatment plant. Some are gonna make it through the process unchanged and some are gonna get broken down. I would encourage people, a septic system is not a one-time <laughs> activity. When you put in a septic system, it's always recommended that it gets, um, you know, that you that you take the stuff out on a, on a regular basis and maintain it. And so um, as much as we can, you know, septic systems are also a wonderful thing. Um, and in parts of the world where they don't have access to this technology, there's waterborne pathogens and real problems with human health. So it's great that we have these technologies, but we must maintain them. We, you know, pay attention to your septic system. Does it need to be pumped? You know, it, it, make sure that it's functioning and operational um, so that there aren't some unwanted consequences of that. Well, and, and I would also say, don't flush your drugs down your toilet, even if you have a septic system. Absolutely. Because they're eventually gonna get out into the environment one way or another, right? Yes, absolutely. And some of them may get filtered through soils and other things, but it's just, you know, don't assume that you have your own little world and you can pollute it to the extent you want to because it's going to have other impacts. Excellent. So there are two questions that are sort of linked um, and, and I'll try and bring them together. They have to do with the regulatory process and it's, you know, are these regulated? How would they become regulated? And what is the responsibility of corporations that invent new artificial uh, compounds for testing them before they're released on us? Yeah, so um, most of these drugs that I'm talking about, the pharmaceuticals um, and personal care products are not regulated by the Clean Water Act, by the EPA. They don't, they're not um, on the list of priority pollutants that are regulated by the EPA. So they're not. Um, it, it takes a long time for a compound to be listed uh, as a priority pollutant. Um, you, there's a lot of research that has to go into figuring out whether or not something should be a priority, should wastewater treatment plants have to have a permit to discharge. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a challenge. Now, the, the Food and Drug Administration is the one, they regulate the health and safety of um, pharmaceuticals. So if, you, if you're a manufacturing facility or you're a company that develops a new pharmaceutical product, you go through a rigorous process before it can be sold as a pharmaceutical through the Food and Drug Administration. Um, but that doesn't, but then once it's, through that process, then it, it, once it goes into the environment, then it falls under the EPA. And so they're not currently regulated um, by the EPA. Um, so that's, that's the way the process works. Right, and, and it will be a while before they are. Yeah, it's, we're, I mean, I told you there's 1400 compounds. I mean, uh, there's a lot of compounds to think about. And, right. and, and in fact, um, I, and every day new, 
amazing drugs are put on the marketplace, right? Which is great. It's right. great. And so, you know, whether or not what route, um, how we deal with this is, is a question. But, you know, one thing that is great about this issue or um, it's a, the, you know, a lot of environmental issues are really hard to solve. And this one, it's not that it's easy. It's not. But they typically are coming from our sewage. They're right. typically coming through our waste stream because we use them in our everyday lives. And so if we can invest in this infrastructure to do a really good job of removing these type of pollutants, um, this problem will be less of a problem. And, <laughs> so, and any idea of manufacturing improper disposal and coming out of our bodies, any idea on what the ratios of that are or which mm -hmm. are the highest? I'm not going like, to hazard a guess on that, Josh. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's there are a lot coming from a lot of places. Yes, correct. <laughs> correct. All right. Well, we've got a few minutes to go, but um, you know, I think that more or less covers a lot of questions. There are some questions like, how can I talk to Dr. Rosie about this more? Um, if you go to our website, uh, Emma has her own web page. There are lots of links to uh, articles, both in the popular press, to her scientific papers to other talks that she and I and others have had. Um, we uh, really try and answer questions. Um, we'll try, if they're in the Q&A, uh, there are some questions. We'll try and see if we can post answers to things we didn't get to. Um, but fundamentally, it's uh, I will say that, that Emma is extremely busy. And I think she would love in other times to sit and have coffee with every one of you and talk to you about what she does. Because as you can see, she is deeply passionate about this. Um, you know, I'd like to thank Emma for a really wonderful conversation. Um, again, I would rather we were sitting here with a glass of wine and it was, it was uh, more fun that way. But thank you so much uh, for agreeing to do this. Uh, thank you to the large number of people who showed up. Uh, we're at 263 right now. We peaked at almost 300 people. Um, we're going to be having another science conversation uh, for our Earth Day. Uh, we can maybe Lori can pop that up. Uh, Dr. Ray Wingrant, who's a bear biologist and a National Geographic explorer. Uh, Lori mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, I think it's really important to put out one's biases. Uh, Ray was one of my PhD students, so uh, I will say that I am exceptionally proud of her. She's done remarkable work with National Geographic, with the American Museum of Natural History, and she and I will be talking about the bare necessities uh, uh, you know, for our Earth Day programming. Uh, I'd also like to thank Harney Tees um, because they are a sponsor of all of our public lectures. Uh, Mike Harney and Elise Harney and, and uh, all of the Harney family has been really great about pivoting and saying, however you get your message out, we'd like to support you through their 1% for the planet program. So thank you very much uh, to Harney Tees. Uh, Lori Quillen uh, and uh, her entire staff uh, have done a remarkable job at making this look easy. Um, and so to all of you, uh, you've got four extra minutes of your evening. I'll say good night and look forward to seeing you uh, in April at our next Carry Science Conversation. So have a great night and thank you for coming.